I normally walk up, as you know, to sort of get here about the time the last song's over. I got some Bob singing that song and didn't realize it's over. <laughs> Turn with me to the third chapter of the book of John, please. How many of you are listening to radio or television preachers are in conversation with somebody about religion have heard them talk about born again Christians well I dare say most of us have at least we've heard the term born again Christians well, it comes from what is taught in John 3, but it's certainly a twisting of the scriptures because anybody that becomes a Christian must, must be born again in order to become or in the process of becoming a Christian. And yet many people will talk about Christians, and then they'll talk about a born-again Christian. Well, that's denominational man-made nomenclature. It's not speaking as the oracles of God at all. To be born again is the only way then to become a child of God. You were born into your family, and the family added you you didn't choose to join it. But the family added you by mom and daddy's choice under normal natural circumstances to be part of that family. And when you're a part of the family of God, the church of the living God, 1 Timothy 3.15, then you're added to it through the spiritual procreative process. The Word of God is the seed of the kingdom. The kingdom does not exist where the Word of God, the seed of it, has not gone, meaning where people have not been taught the gospel. When people believe and obey the gospel, then that seed is germinated as it was sown in the mind of a person and an honest and good heart, Luke 8, verse 15. And thus, when one is saved by it, then they are born, a spiritual birth. And that's what Jesus introduces here at a time when the Jews especially, but really everybody at that time, but since they're Jews and they have the background of the patriarchs and the law of Moses, then their concept of being acceptable to God was to be born in a physical birth, being a descendant of Abraham through Jacob. So when you talked about a new Christian then, or a new birth, then just like Nicodemus, you're going to just about have the same reaction. Now let's begin this study in John 3. There was a man, was there, and the scripture says, there was, there was a man. That's what historians wrote at that time. They didn't say such and such happened in December, whatever, 19 when. That's the way they did it. There was a man and what kind of man was he? There was a man, and that man was of the Pharisees. Now, if this is all new to me, I have to understand the Jews had denominationalism going quite well at that day among them. The Pharisees were a sect of the Jews, as was the Sadducees and the Essenes, who you don't read about in the New Testament. The Pharisees are the strictest, it was them that Jesus got into it with most because they bound their traditions to the exclusion of doing what the law of Moses said. 
I be in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, Jesus said. But they were the strictest. They believed in the resurrection. They believed man had a soul. They believed in angels. Sadducees didn't. They didn't believe in the resurrection. I call them the 2,000-year-old, quote, Jehovah's Witnesses, unquote, as that term is used today. Because neither do they, as well as Seventh-day Adventists, believe in such things. But this is not of the Sadducees, this man. He's a Pharisee. And he has a name. It's Nicodemus. But he's more than that. He's a ruler of the Jews. This man's an important person among the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. Why did he come by night? I have no idea. Nobody else does. You know why I don't? The scripture doesn't reveal it. You can conjecture from now till doomsday and you will not know. You can say, well, he didn't want to bother Jesus during the daytime. You don't know that. Or he was busy and couldn't come. You don't know that. Or he was the man that he was and couldn't afford to be seen with Jesus. And you don't know that. That's speculation. You can't prove it. I tell you what I can prove. I can prove there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night. Now that's going the limit the Scriptures allows us to go. And there's nothing else in the Bible to give us more light on that. If I could go to some other place and find extra information, I'd add that to this. But I can't do it about Nicodemus. So he comes to Jesus from night and he had something to say. And notice the respect. He calls him Rabbi. I think today they call him Rabs. But that is a great position among the Jews. And Jesus certainly was a teacher. And he says, we. I don't know who else he had in mind. I don't know whether he's speaking of the other rulers with him because this probably means that he was one of the, of the uh, council. But he says, we know. We know what? That thou art a teacher. But not just a teacher. He's a teacher come from God. Well, how do you know that? Well, he did what a great many of the Jews wouldn't do. He said, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, he hasn't come to the conclusion that thou art the Messiah, thou art the Son of God. But he's very familiar with Old Testament prophets and the miracles they worked. He would not be ignorant of what John the Baptist had been doing. How much he paid attention to all of it, I don't know. But he doesn't seem like someone who is just uh, near do well in his learning about things. And after all, what all went on in his mind motivated him to come to Jesus. And that's more than you can say for a lot of people. Remember, I questioned this morning, who is Jesus? This man knew who he was and made it a point to go see him and then declared his position that we know you're a teacher and you're a teacher from God because you have demonstrated the credentials. Now remember what John said as we quoted this morning and when we started this study and have quoted it many times, John 20, 30, 31, about the signs or the miracles being signs that he was the Son of God. God has never asked us or any man any time just to accept something without proof. He never has. That's why we're taught in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, prove all things. All things. And that leaves no one out. Prove all things and hold fast that which is good, implying that when you start the proving process, you may find some things that are not good because they don't bear out to what they claim to be. Humans should have inquiring minds. Some of us were talking at noon. Well, the big problem stay in America, but it's even in the church. People don't care. They don't care what they believe. They mainly care about doing what makes them happy. Whatever that is, sometimes they don't know what that is. But there was a time, and you know, things have to change to go from the time when people wanted to study the Bible because it's the Word of God, and they wouldn't know what God wanted them to do. And you could set up Bible studies until this time when there are just not that many out there 
that you can find that says, I want to study the Bible. When was the last time you heard anybody say that? I want to study the Bible. I think if one did, I'd say, well, why do you want to study the Bible? And I hope he would answer because I want to know what God wants me to do in this life. But they don't. Today, everybody is just simply calloused and cold to any interest overall. I speak in generalities, of course, to religious matters in general. Well, he said those things, and then we get to verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily. Well, why do we find the verilies? Verily comes from a Greek word from which we get amen. That's the way it is. It's a fact. It's the truth. And he says it twice. So be it. So be it. I. And remember who he knows that Nicodemus has confessed him to be. A teacher come from God. Because he recognizes the miracles point that out about Jesus. But he hits him with a broadside. Remember what we said earlier on? They had no concept of being born again. And he confuses him immediately. You know, sometimes before we learn what we need to learn, we need to get good, good confused. <laughs> Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. That little except, except there is a very important word. You know, when Jesus is teaching about marriage, divorce, remarriage, he said in Matthew 19, 9, except it be for fornication. That is, a person puts away a mate, then it's adultery, except one of them, except, except one of them commits fornication. Well, what's the force of that? It's in our language, it communicates something to us. What's the force of it? It's the same force in Matthew 19, 9 as it is right here. Except means... If and only if a man's born again can he see the kingdom of God. That's what it means. If you take that back to Matthew 19, 9, it means if you're divorced for reasons other than what's given in Matthew 19, 9, then you have no authority from God to be divorced. It's if and only if one spouse committed fornication, the other spouse has the authority to put that spouse away. And here it's if and only if a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you might say, see there would have to do with enter into it, be a part of it. But Nicodemus is thoroughly confused right now. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? So you can see his mind's hung up in a very narrow box. He has only one concept of being born, of a birth. Of, and it's a physical birth. That's all he has. He doesn't understand. All right. Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb be born? In other words, this is ludicrous to tell me I must be born again. I've just admitted you're a teacher come from God. And we know that because of the credentials you provide. It says they are. Now you say something like this. And now he knew also that they were both Jews. They had the same background in the knowledge of the Old Testament. But Jesus answers him this way. And again, he puts a couple of verilies ahead of it. Which means, you can take this to the bank. It's the truth. So be it, so be it, I say unto thee. I'm that teacher that you said you know came from God because of the miracles I worked. And I'm saying to you, here's an except again. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot. He's not able to enter into the kingdom of God. But remember the power of the word accept, an acceptive clause is an if and only if you do this. If and only if you're born of water and and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now that's very interesting. 
Because when you look through the scriptures, you'll find that Peter will say in writing to Christians, and remember they would have been born again, wouldn't they? They would have been born of water and the Spirit. But Peter writes these scriptures, Christians many years later in 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 23. And he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, unpretending, unhypocritical love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. But now watch verse 23. Being born again. But then he says something that by the Spirit that Jesus didn't go into in John 3, 3 and 5. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Remember what we said earlier about the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, Luke 8, 11. There, is no, there are no citizens of the kingdom where the word of God has not gone or the seed has been sown in the minds of men who are honest and good-hearted, Luke 8, 15. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The old song says, are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? There is no kingdom where the seed of the kingdom has not gone. And we see that it is the word, the seed of the kingdom, that must be sown in the minds of men. That is, they must be taught. You know about the kingdom. You know about the king. You know about the citizens of the kingdom. You know about entrance into the kingdom and all about the kingdom in one way and one way only. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And that's a shame before God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 And uh, Peter ties in then this business of being born again with the word of God. Two elements are involved in one action. Or we might say one transaction. The birth of water and the Spirit. You're not born of water and then you're born later of the Spirit. It's the Spirit operating through what Peter say? Well, Peter said it very plainly, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which live and abide forever. There are no Christians where the Word of God hasn't gone. And the Spirit does not work upon people to convert them to Christ except through His instrument, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Now look at Titus chapter 3 here for a moment. Titus, a young preacher like Timothy, who was expected to preach the word and live a godly life and to contend for the faith and be all that God expected a Christian to be plus an evangelist of the Lord. In Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, Paul writing to Titus, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Sounds like America. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Watch it. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit which he shed abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Again, that echoes John 3, 3, 5. The new birth. Whatever God is going to do to the person to make him a Christian, it doesn't happen except that that person must will it to happen. And what he must will is to submit to his Savior's will, the gospel of Christ being where that will is found, the seed of the kingdom, the word of God. And that's why Peter wrote like he did. Now, what are we seeing in all of this? 
we're seeing that to be born of water in the Spirit is to receive the Word, to understand the Word, and to understand the way of salvation. When Jesus said in Mark's account of the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's through the gospel people learn about salvation. Being born of water and the Spirit. And he simply summed it up this way in Mark's account. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be down. So to be born of water in the Spirit is to follow the instructions of the Spirit in being baptized for the remission of your sins. It's that simple. Thus God acts upon man. He acts upon man through the instrumentality of the Word of God. But that's the sword of the Spirit. And if you look at Hebrews 4, and verse number 12, you see just how potent that is, for the Word of God is quick and powerful. That means alive and active. People talk about the Word of God being a dead letter. Well, the Word of God itself doesn't indicate it's dead. He's saying here the Word of God's quick or alive and powerful. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword that might cut through your body. It pierces even to the divining asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And here's what it does to people who listen to it and take it to heart. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Those people on the day of Pentecost when they heard the message of salvation presenting its fullness for the first time since the church was established. They listened to that evidence preached by Peter. They knew it was from heaven and not from men because of the miracles that were being worked there on that day. And when you see that, you realize that they were pricked in their heart. Well, what was pricked? And it was the word, the gospel that pricked it. They were devout people. They weren't rank, immoral Gentiles. They were there on that day because they believed in doing the law of Moses, which is the only thing they understood about how to serve God. And the Bible even calls them devout Jews. By the way, that's the same term, same word in the Greek. That's applied to Cornelius. That's interesting. These were devout Jews. These weren't rabble. And lo and behold, they've come to do what they understand the law requires of them to be pleasing to God, and they find out it won't work anymore. You've got to divest yourself of that way of approaching God. It won't work anymore. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. And they learned, having been charged with crucifying and slaying the Son of God, they learned that the proof was in, and Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, sitting at the right hand of God, ruling. And they interrupt the sermon. Now, why? Because that Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is alive and active, and it pierced them even to the dividing of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of in thought, of an intense of their heart. They were pricked in their heart. That's what it means when it says pricked in their heart. Their conscience hurts them. These are devout people. They don't want to offend God. They're there to please God. Many of them travel from all over the Roman Empire and elsewhere to be there to do what they believe God said to do to be pleasing to God. The Jews under the law required the men to come three times a year to Jerusalem. These people were there. What we read of the history books is that Jerusalem just swelled up and overflowed with people coming from all over the world. And why are they there? Because they want to serve God. They want to be pleasing to Him. And then they find out what? Ye have taken it with wicked hands, have crucified and slain the Son of God. Nobody mints words about what happened to Jesus and who did it. And they were pricked in their heart and they cried out. They didn't just mutter. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, I'd fall out of the pulpit. Somebody jumped out of there and hollered like that after me preaching. I would, I'd take me a minute to get all collected. But they cried out. That says something about their devoutness and honesty of heart. And the prick of the heart they received for having done evil when they thought they were doing good. 
And they're told, because they're believers, evidenced by what shall we do, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And now they are in the same position as Peter described them. In fact, Peter, being the apostle of the Jews, may have very well have been addressing some of those people in First Peter right here. Some of those very people that obeyed the gospel on that first Pentecost, seeing you purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And that's exactly what happened when you read about it on the day the church started there in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. So they were baptized. Verse 41 said, they that glad to receive his word were baptized. Verse 42 said, they were added to the church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of bread. Verse 47 says, as many as were saved were added to the church. The Lord doing the adding because he knows the hearts of men. And you have to obey from the heart. And he knows whether you obeyed from your heart. Did you understand what you were doing? Did you know the truth? Did you apply it correctly? Only you and God can know that. I can't know it. And you can't know it about somebody else. They can even tell you about that. But I still can't know it like God's going to know it. Because he knows all things. Instead of Jesus, he knew what was in man. He still does. Now, it's hard maybe for us to understand that. But he knows our every motive. He knows why we do what we do. He knows the reason that we did it. So we simply see in these few scriptures what being born again is. And you see it's a necessity. Nobody becomes a Christian except they're born of water and the Spirit. Except you be born of water and the Spirit. If and only if you're born of water and the Spirit. Receiving with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, James says. Well, why? Because it teaches us he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Saul of Tarsus, who had been persuaded that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God, did as Christ told him and went into the street called Straight in Damascus, Syria, and there waited for the preacher that Jesus had selected, Ananias. Ananias came and found this man's a believer. He's repented. He's fasting right now in proof of that repentance. And when he sees that he's met those qualifications in the gospel, he says, And now, why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's the same as when Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. It means by the authority of Christ. See, the Jews believed in God. They had to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a son of God. And there's where the rub was with them. But it's teaching here Nicodemus. And every Jew had to understand what Jesus taught Nicodemus if he was to become a Christian. You must be born again. Except ye be born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You can't trust in the law of Moses any longer. You can't trust in being a descendant of Abraham through Jacob. You can't trust in circumcision anymore. You can't trust in any aspect of the law. And as Paul would write later on, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. And thus through faith in Christ, faith created by adequate evidence and credible witnesses that he's the only begotten Son of God, then they heard the word that Jesus had given and they met the conditions to obtain salvation. The Lord added to the church, and so it is today. It hasn't changed. It'll read that way and mean that way on the day of judgment even as it does now. And we in the church must not water down that gospel. We must preach it just as it is. If you're not a child of God, we implore you, we beg of you to become one before you leave this building today. If as a child of God, you've let it slip, you've wandered, you've got off into sin, we urge you to be honest with yourself and God as He searches your heart with you, that you'll repent of those sins and come confess them and pray God for forgiveness. If you're therefore subject to the blessed invitation of Jesus, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.